Hello everyone! In this video I'll show you how to use differential growth add-on for Blender. Alright, first things first, let's see how to go about installing this add-on to Blender. You can grab the latest release from the GitHub page, the link in the video description. You go to Releases, click on the latest release and download the source code as a zip file. So I already have it, I'll write on top of that. Then in Blender, as usual, Edit, Preferences, Add-ons, click Install, select the file, Install, and then don't forget to actually activate it. Once you activate it, notice that in Object Properties, there is now an entirely new section called Differential Growth. This is our add-on. Okay, the add-on now installed. Now we need to create a shape. For the purposes of this video, I'll be using a single mesh, which I'm referring to as a unit disk. So Shift A to create a mesh. Select a circle here, tap to enter the edit mode. Then here, press E to extrude. Press S to start scaling. Press zero to converge all the points to the center. Now press enter. And now let's merge these points together. Let's weld them. Uh, so press M to enter the merge menu and select at center. So now we have a unit disk which we will be working with. Now we also need to assign weights to the vertices. The thing about this algorithm is that it is optimized for growing on the boundaries. So I select all these boundary vertices using loop select and then go to this object data properties the green one and uh, under vertex groups I first create a group then assign the maximum weights to the vertices I just selected so you should be able to see the picture like this when you go to weight paint mode and I'll also switch here to wireframe so that we have a better idea of what the mesh topology looks like after we apply a couple of simulation steps to it. Okay, now let's just run the algorithm a bunch of times with all the default settings and see what we're getting. As you can see, the most active vertices start to get pushed away from each other. And then when the distance between them becomes too long, they will get subdivided like so. This actually mimics the growth behavior in the living organisms whereby the cells get subdivided and then push the other cells away thus producing some interesting results. And as you can see I run a number of steps. This is intentional because every now and then you may want to scroll back for example if you overdo stuff and you decide, well, this is not the, exactly the shape that I want, you may want to go back using Command Z and then tweak some of the parameters and start with new parameters, like so, for example, right? Here, I just changed the um, split radius, which is the this kind of maximum allowed distance where the split occurs. So 0.5 refers to the longer edges and 0.25 makes the edges shorter and thus increases the mesh resolution. This is our first and very important parameter. But the point being is that you will probably have to go back and forth until you get the result that you want. And because of that, I highly recommend going here, Edit Preferences System, and setting the Undo steps to maximum, which is 256. Now I can safely experiment, I can go back and forth, tweak the parameters, and I can always return back to my original unit disk that we started with. Cool, let's now see what the parameters are doing. We kind of covered the split radius, which is basically the maximum allowed length of the edge before it gets subdivided. And one thing to note is that the 
subdivision is also applied proportionally to the average weight of this edge. So one way of thinking about the split radius is basically whenever you have the red edge like so, then yeah, then it cannot exceed 0.5, it will get subdivided. Whereas if you have an edge like this, then it can actually be a bit longer. A typical way of using this parameter is to actually control the mesh resolution. So as you decrease the split radius, you get more subdivisions, therefore you get a higher mesh resolution. Now the second most important parameter is how many vertices, how many neighboring vertices to consider when calculating the repulsion force. This is really important. Let's let me scroll back to my original disk. And let me start with the repulsion radius of two. You can see that the vertices now get pushed more aggressively from each other, right? And then, for example, I am really happy with this shape. I want to get it a little more detailed. So I start decreasing the repulsion radius so that the vertices are not as repelled from each other as they used to be. And then I also decrease the split radius to maybe 0.25. And now you can see that the level of detail is significantly increased and we can add a final iteration uh, with split radius maybe 0.1 and this uh, repulsion radius maybe 0.3 so that you can create really really fine intricate details at the end. Okay step size there is not too much about it is just the multiplier of the force which is applied on each simulation step. So the bigger the step size is, the faster the simulation goes. It also makes the simulation a lot less accurate, so there is a higher chance of uh, vertices to actually self-intersect, as you can see here. Really, really messy. I mean, sometimes it does make sense to increase the step size, especially if you're working with weights that are lower than one, then it does make sense to speed up the simulation. But most of the time, you need to keep it reasonably small, but not too small so that your simulation actually runs. If you run into troubles like um, with very intricate details self intersecting, then maybe it is the case for reducing the step size. But that's it. And the step scale basically applies the transformation unevenly on each axis uh, individually. So I can, for example, limit the Z movement to 0.5 and that would mean that a lot less vertical movement will happen. It will still happen, but a lot less than before. All right, we covered the basics. Now to the forces. Currently, algorithm supports three forces, which is attraction force, repulsion force, and noise force. Now, attraction force is disabled by default. You can enable it. And just to illustrate how it works, let me disable everything else and just run it a little. So yeah, the attraction is basically the force that aims to get vertices as close to each other as possible. Really boring. Uh, on its own, but when combined with everything else, it can produce some results. I tend to keep it disabled by default, uh, but you can enable it and try an experiment with it. You can see that the shape becomes a little bit different, which you may or may not like. So, as usual, a lot of trial and error needs to happen before you can find the shape that you like. But yeah, that's the attraction force. The repulsion force, we already obviously seen it. If you disable it, then not too much of the actual growth will happen, I'm afraid. Uh, but still, it is somewhat handy to make it configurable. So for example, you can uh, say that 
the vertices need to repel a lot more than they need to be attracted to each other. Again, it is here for you to experiment with it, basically. And the third force is noise. It is used to break out of the symmetry. So let me show you. If I disable it and just keep the repulsion force in the object like this, then it will just keep expanding gradually without, without breaking from the plane, you know, who just produced this disk. At some point, it may start a bit of a random movement, but that's just due to the precision errors rather than something uh, truly random. So let's try and see whether that will ever happen. Maybe it will. But as you can see, without applying the noise, this simulation becomes kind of boring and you just don't get the organic feel from it. Besides, you can't really break away from this plane. So what you see here is a completely flat, flat mesh. And yeah, it's basically the noise, the 3D noise that is applied to each vertex in a very small way but it does allow us to break away from the plane and to start producing some sort of organic results. And that's it. So the noise scale here affects the frequency of the noise. If you aim to get finer details, more randomized, it does make sense to increase the noise scale as you go uh, forward with increasing the resolution. But other than that, there is not too much to it. All right, growth direction. Here's what it does. By default, the growth direction is assumed to be up towards where the sun is supposed to be. So if I just set it to something like 10 to make the results uh, faster, this is what happens. Basically, you can see that the growth now mostly occurs uh, towards this direction. If I make it minus 10, uh, then all of a sudden, bam, we go down. Hmm. I don't like it, but this is something to experiment with. And you can also use a custom object. So here I created an empty, just a random point in the world, basically. And now I can assign a reference to the growth direction here and if I continue with my simulation steps, you can see now it grows here in towards these arrows. All right, and the last section is called growth inhibitors. So as you might have noticed, on each simulation step, we also recalculate the weights of the vertices. By default, the weight of the boundary vertices stays the same and the weight of the non-boundary vertices is reduced according to this base factor. If I remove it, then the weights will now stay the same. And that means that these vertices also participate in the growth. So basically the force is applied to them. And this is the shape that you will get somewhat bulky bulky shape, which is also interesting, but most of the time I just keep this base factor as one and it seems to work well on a wide variety of shapes. The second one, which is called shell factor, is actually a lot more interesting because it allows us to inhibit growth selectively on the boundary vertices. And let me just start by setting it to one and see how it works. So every now and then, some pointy vertices get inhibited and then their neighbors get more growth because of that. And this allows you to create highly non-uniform shapes like so. This is also one of the cases where you might want to increase the step size, but not too crazy, maybe to something like 0.2 to run the simulations faster because in this case you no longer have the weights of one on each boundary vertices therefore very small movement happens with the default step size you have to increase it 
So yeah, as the weight continues decreasing, you may want to keep increasing the step size to make it um, to sustain the growth. You can see something pretty, pretty interesting just happened, right? Uh, and one of my examples on my website, I just created it by combining this shelf factor and growth direction, the vertical growth direction. So let me just go back to my disk here. I'll set growth direction upwards to five, then the shelf factor of one. Let's just see how it goes. You know, it starts like so, then some of the vertices survive basically and then continue to thrive upwards grow and start somewhat resembling the seaweed then if i increase the step size like so i'll get a bit more vigorous growth right so you can see pretty cool pretty pretty cool and you can just keep it going and going and going and see what happens, right? But be cautious because you only have 256 steps to revert if you change your mind. And the final example I want to show is the combination of shelf factor and the step scale. Uh, which I want to limit on the Z axis to something like 0.5, maybe it will work well. This is probably my favorite one. It starts like so. And then it creates this lichen kind of shape. And again, you can just keep it going and going and going and just just enjoy this result basically right what i like about it specifically is how multiple layers become overlapping and yeah just keep it going and going and you can actually make it a bit more pointy so to speak if you increase the shell factor to two or maybe higher maybe four, something like that. Basically make it, make these subdivisions more aggressive. All righty, so I just kept running the simulation steps and this is the final shape I ended up with. As you can see, I also added solidify modifier and subdivision surface modifier. Just a word of warning, it takes ages to compute because of the insane amount of triangles. Uh, but anyway, with this beautiful, beautiful topology, I would like to conclude this introduction. Thank you for watching the video. I hope you found it useful. If you enjoyed it, please like, subscribe, repost, basically just spread the love. Also consider starting this on GitHub. This way uh, more people will get to know about this add-on. And thank you again for watching. Hope you have a lot of fun growing your meshes into weird organic shapes and see you soon.